This week's guest, Linda Kephart Nash, is a first-time published novelist in her 80s. Here she talks about why she wrote When the Tempest Passes and the Wicked is No More, based on her grandmother's life story. I thought, well, maybe I'll quit thinking about her so much and she'll quit waking me up at night. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my mother and co-host, Caroline Kilborn. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> with, me a thousand, <laughs> with me a thousand miles away, of course. Yes. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, but... The wonders of technology. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, Mom, tell us a little bit about our guest today. This is this is a, a very interesting, very interesting story. This is um, uh, Linda Kepport Nash, and um, she's a first-time novelist, and she felt her grandmother's story needed telling. Haunting memories gave no rest until an 83-year-old, as an 83-year-old, she began to write. She, she is descended from Norwegian pioneers. Kephart Nash is married to a minister, raised six children, and obtained a nursing degree, then practicing both ends of life spectrum, obstetrics and geriatrics. And uh, she is, uh, uh, in, this book is extremely interesting. It's called When the Tempest Passes and the Wicked is No More. And so she's going to tell us about why she chose that title and also did a lot of other things, I hope. <laughs> Welcome to Writer's Voices, Linda. Well, thank you. I'm uh, happy to uh, have been invited, so thank you. Well, let's start with your name. Because um, the book is published under L. Kephart Nash, and there's I think there's a story behind that. Uh, yes, uh, my daughter helps me with things uh, that are, have to do with computers, and uh, when she wanted to ask me, you know, what how I wanted my name to be uh, put on the book, I, I told her, and she Googled it, and there was a whole string of uh, Linda Nashes that have books out, and I thought I better not take that name. <laughs> <laughs> And I started switching it around, and uh, at one point, you know, I had all these letters, and it was too long, and so we kept deleting things. It just ended up with an L instead of Valinda, and then Kephart dash Nash, and there were there was no one that had a book out by that name, so that's <laughs> why. And I'm, I'm assuming Kephart is your maiden name. Yes, it is. Yeah. And is is it the well, tell it, you, you know, you mentioned that this is, or your intro says this is your grandmother's story. Is this your father's mother, your mother's mother? How are you related to the people you're writing about? Uh, it's my mother's mother, yeah, the, the maternal side. So, first of all, you just had a meet the authors party, I understand, just recently. Yeah. How did that uh, go? That went uh, very well, uh, I think mainly because Kurt Swarm, uh, he led me through the whole thing. I would have been lost without him. So anyway, he was uh, wonderful to help me out the way he did. And told me oh, yes. the, what I needed to do. So. Well, actually, but how it, you it started went. this writing was, didn't you uh, 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 attend a writer's workshop of his that he had? Uh, yes, I did. Uh because my daughter uh, encouraged me to do that. I, I, she knew I liked to write poems, and I was throwing them away and uh, not happy with things, and she have, had seen his uh, name in the paper and phone number, and she got me started. I called him. I, I, it made me nervous. I thought, well, I have nothing to show, nothing <laughs> to offer. So anyway, but he was wonderful about you know making me welcome. Now, Caroline, you're familiar with him, correct? With Kurt well, Swarm. I read his column in the in the in the Union. That's our, okay. our paper. So he's yeah. so he's a local journalist, right? Yeah, I, I've never mm -hmm. met him, but he yes, yeah. He, he writes interesting things, you know, and uh, so um, and he, because he was just he was really impressed with uh, with Linda's book and uh, her writing, and so I thought, well, I think we should probably interview her. <laughs> He certainly is your number one fan, isn't he, Linda? 
Well, he's been wonderful, yes. <laughs> and he's, he, he he writes for 40 different newspapers, so uh, for wow. Iowa. Wow, <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. So, and he teaches writing, obviously, and so he had you, you were in, in a class that he took, and he took you under his wing, it seems like. Um, uh -huh. And he wrote about you in his column that Caroline read, and she sent it to me and said, "We should, we should interview Linda. We should, we should get her on the show." We don't do a lot of local authors because we do a lot of we do writers from all over the world, all over the country, and um, but we like to make room for some Iowa authors too. Uh, well, I think that's that's a wonderful thing to do, and I'm sure they all appreciate it. So. First of all, the, the way that this book is organized is so interesting because you used, um, oh, the first, the first chapter is a time to be born and a time to die. And of course, it's from the Bible, uh, from Ecclesiastics. And why did you choose that, that format? Well, uh, that, uh, portion of scripture has always been one that I thought was so beautifully, uh, poetic and, uh, since I think so much and so often about my grandparents, my grandmother, uh, I thought I got to thinking one day, oh, this just fits her life. It just it fits what she went through, and uh, it just seemed right when I decided that that's, that was what I wanted uh, to guide the book, and uh, and because because she was such such a Christian woman and uh, her faith was probably all that got her through what she went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that she had to, she had to have a very strong faith to, to be able to survive what she did. Yes, so. yes. But, uh, but she always seemed like a sad woman and uh, at times in times angry. And uh, I, I think she really didn't have enough left over. From, she lavished everything she had on her children, and I, th I mm -hmm. don't think there was much left over to be a nourishing grandmother. And so uh, I, I don't worry about that anymore. But for a long time, I thought I don't like you, you know. <laughs> but I don't feel I don't feel that way anymore. <laughs> How well did you know her? Uh, very well, because uh, the last uh, three years I was at home. Uh, she lived with us then uh, because she just was not well enough to uh, be on her own. And so her children talked with my mother, and uh, and she was, she was most comfortable, I think, with my mother uh, of the two girls. Well, the other one was in Waterloo, and my mother was only eight miles away, so uh, she stayed uh, near the two brothers then, So and my mother. And uh, and lived her last three years with us, and uh, it was a sad time. And she she had a lot of physical pain with with the deterioration of her back. You know, it was terribly deformed from the uh, bones crumbling. And uh, they she didn't doctor that much, and I don't think they did. They had the things to help them back then as much as they do now. So. Oh, I'm sure. Uh -huh. Well, she had how many? See, she had she lost several children, and and had, yeah. how many children did she have that survived? Then four, four surviving children. Yeah, two sons and then two daughters. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and of course she had a lot of losses in her family before that. I mean, first of all, her brother. Uh huh. You know, yeah. 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 He, at eighteen, yeah, he drowned, and. Uh, then her sister was 21, and she died from uh, drinking contaminated uh, cow's milk. It was unpasteurized. Oh, gosh. And she was 21. And, and so she, it was, she was a real, yeah. yeah, she was really yeah. close to your to your grandmother, too, wasn't she? Olga was really close to her. Uh, yes, the, the sister Olga, yes. Because uh, yeah. I, okay. I, my grandmother named uh, her second daughter Olga. You know, so it gets mm -hmm. confusing sometimes with two yeah. Olgas too. So, but yes, she was very close to her sister and her brother. And of course, uh, I I thought for years that um, the first sister Hannah, um, uh, you know, was in the picture, but uh, she actually died before uh, my grandmother uh, was born. Uh, she was uh, she died of consumption at the age of five. 
So oh, my, gra- my great grandmother lost uh, one daughter before the son drowned, and then her uh, third daughter uh, drowned, uh, uh, died of the uh, milk. So my uh, my grandmother was the only survivor in her family for many long years, and they weren't particularly mm-hmm. happy. <laughs> Well, she had a she had a rough start in the first yeah. place because uh, her uh, um, intended husband, in, in, whom she loved very much, uh, um, disappeared right yeah. before the wedding, uh-huh. and yeah. that was a uh, that was you know that was really a terrible way to start the situation, wasn't it? That it was traumatic for her, and at that time too, it would be so humiliating. And, oh, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, and the wedding was set and the, the, the day of the wedding arrived and he just didn't show up, but he vanished, you know, nobody had any explanation of mm-hmm. uh, what happened, where he went, uh, just gone. So, uh, it's just thinking about a lot of things that I've put together, what I think happened, but, uh, that, that that's why I say I may have misjudged my grandfather horribly <laughs> but uh a lot now, of it wasn't <laughs> so how much how much uh interaction with your grandfather did you have because he's he's not the hero of the story no no <laughs> no, he isn't. no he's not. and but uh my family and i lived in, with uh, my grandparents uh, off and on and, you know as we moved between uh houses and jobs uh so uh, i actually lived in the house with them uh different times um and uh, and was uh you know accustomed to seeing him but i don't know why we kids had kind of a fear of him and we avoided him but i remember his presence always silent and he died when i was 10 but uh i in all that time i knew him and the time we had in the house and coming for sunday dinners when we didn't live there I spoke to him only once in my entire life, and that was uh, one day when I happened to uh, go out the kitchen door. He was sitting on uh, the bench she'd built for my grandmother when she shelled peas and churned butter, and he was sitting there looking at over at the pig pen, and uh, I stayed out of reach of where his, he had a cane always with him, and I always stayed out of reach of that for some reason. I don't know why. And uh stood looking at him, and I didn't say anything, and I was probably seven. And he reached into his vest and brought out a paper bag, and he opened it up, and he held it out to me, and he said, do you want a piece of candy? And I was kind of I was real shy and I kind of shrugged one shoulder and I said I don't care and so he reached a finger in took a candy out popped it in his mouth folded the sack up and put it back in his pocket and uh I really did not like him at that point <laughs> and I thought he was horrible <laughs> and uh, I went running to my mother and I told her what happened and she was kind of very blasé about it she said well how did you answer him you know, what did you say back to him when he offered you the candy? And I told her, and she said, well, next time, just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, there was never a next time. <laughs> so anyway, but no, that's the only time I ever spoke to him. Now, the book is set starting in the late 1800s, 1890s. Yes. And goes into the 1900s. And that for farm families in the upper midwest that was a pretty hard time wasn't it i mean life was hard oh it was yes yeah i can remember uh, in the summers when i would see the men bringing the horses out you know and uh, they were sweating everybody sweating and hooking the horses up and by the time they brought them back at the end of the day all those horses dragged and covered with foam and Boy, they were exhausted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was tough. And then the women, too, you know, they had the garden. And and no matter how hot it got, you took care of the garden and you did the canning. And, and that's why this great old house uh, that they lived in had two kitchens, the summer kitchen, because they tried not to heat the whole house up 
when they did the canning mm-hmm. and the laundry. They heated and cooked everything on big wood iron stoves. And uh, so they, they had the summer kitchen. To, uh, they would butcher and can meat. And, and they churned their own butter. They milked cows. And they butchered the pigs and, and collected eggs. And my mother's job was to get to the chicken coop and uh, not only collect the eggs, but clean the chicken coop. And I can remember her telling me many times, I hated chickens. I hated them. They're filthy, she said. <laughs> she did not like it. So anyway, but she did it. They all had their jobs, and, and the boys helped their father in the fields. And they eventually had a hired man. And, but uh, it was it was a tough life, very tough. Now, now, Caroline, your grandparents on one side were also uh, Iowa farmers. Do yes. you have those memories yes. too, as a child? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, because I spent quite a bit of time at uh, at uh, my grandma Moffat's place, and um, yeah, I, they just let me roam around, you know, and, and go in the barn and climb up in the loft and so forth. And but I was always afraid. I was always afraid of the animals, kind of. So I kind of kept my distance from the animals. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Any but in my particular? Grandmother, my grandmother. My grandmother did all that, you know, all of the canning and everything, and and um, all that stuff. You know, I, you know, what was interesting to me, Linda, was at the first part of the book, uh, it's about Cornelius, that, uh, your grandfather, and how he came to be in, in that area and how he came to be connected with your grandmother's family. And he mm-hmm. seemed to be like a pretty upstanding person. And so I was kind of surprised and when he kind of, I don't know, kind of changed. And mm-hmm. what do you, what do you think caused that? Well, I had uh, I thought about that too, and because uh, like I said, I had been you know brutally unkind to my grandfather, but uh, so uh, but you know what shows on the face doesn't show what's really in the heart either, and yeah. uh, he didn't he didn't have any closely pers- personal uh, relationships that I knew of, you know he he was. What was he? Thirty-three when he got married. He he didn't mm-hmm. date. He worked. He worked because he lived at home and he worked for with his father for his father. But he uh, needed more money, so he hired himself out to local nearby farmers, and he just worked. He worked, and uh, so he stayed single. And uh, I think he didn't have to interact with a wife and children. And uh, so he wasn't, but I, he, I don't think he really liked children. Well, he, he wanted land. He wanted a, a land of his own, and that's why he yes. worked so hard was to save money for that, didn't he? That yeah. was his goal. He wanted a yeah. farm. But, yeah. So that'll be done in a second. <laughs> okay. There. Okay. But in in those days, uh, women did what they were told mostly, and of course, uh, your grandmother was uh, was compliant. In that, of course, it was an arranged marriage because yeah. she mm-hmm. she wasn't in love with him. Um, no, after she her, after she had been, you know, left at the altar, and so it was it was a hard time for her. Yeah, I I think she just planned not to marry again. But I think uh, the family urged her into it because, uh, well, not only was that what Cornelius wanted, you know, he was persistent, but uh, because. For women back then, she did not have a college education. She had no mm-hmm. training. She had mm-hmm. no job. Women didn't work outside the home. They were raised to be one thing, a wife, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, obey the husband, you know. So uh, she really had no options. And, uh, and I think parents urge that because they know that when they're gone, what will happen to their daughters? They love their daughters, and... They want to know they're safe and secure in in a marriage, mm-hmm. you know. But right. uh, sometimes they don't realize the mar- some marriages are worse than living a very very poverty stricken life. Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't she have inherited her parents' farm? Uh, yes, it was supposed to have been. They they had planned to divide that between uh, the two surviving children. But then Olga died, so it would have become. But they didn't know that at the time, so. Uh, so anyway, but you just wonder. 
Well, and well, I think men also have the attitude that no woman knows how to run a farm. Uh, that, right. Uh, right. Yeah. That Despite the fact to... that half the time they did half the work. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, they did, and uh, and made things very comfortable, <laughs> food wise and cleanliness wise and everything. But uh, but they were kind of considered not smart enough to run a farm. And, I think I think times have changed. We there are a lot of women farmers now. Thank goodness. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Now, she was fortunate though that her in-laws, um, his family, were very very kind to her and uh, helpful to yeah. her. So that was that was great. Yes, they were. They were. And I can remember my mother telling me that. Uh, and saying it often to Aunt Belle was my favorite, you know, and so mm-hmm. I knew mm-hmm. uh, I knew she had been quite a, a charming lady, and uh, I also knew that uh, the grandmother Marin was a very good grandmother too, and I have pictures of her and always blind, you know, and uh, Belle standing by her and the rest of the family around her, but uh, and she loved her grandchildren and she. Uh, always carried a dime in a pocket. Yeah, tell tell that story. Tell that story. Ah, uh, well, the children just always wondered who was going to be the lucky one that got the dime every time she came to visit, because one of them would uh, be uh, just you know ha- uh, a dime would be pressed into the palm of their little hands, and and uh, they always wondered who was going to be the lucky one today. And uh, she carried that dime in her pocket, and as she sat in her darkness. With her hand in there, she her thumb between a thumb and a finger, she'd polish and polish and polish and stroke that dime. <laughs> and I, I have even thought, well, maybe she was even praying for her children while she was doing that. And yeah. uh, because they were very, very devout. And uh, then uh, before she ever left their visit, she, some one of the children, she would have mentally picked them out. And uh, as they came to say goodbye, why she would. Uh, take their little hands, and then one of them would find a dime in it. So they, they never knew which yeah, one was going to get it. Mm-hmm. And they, they weren't jealous of the, whoever got the dime? Well, not that I know of. My mother told <laughs> it in a very happy fashion, so I knew she didn't get it every time. But <laughs> maybe maybe uh, the grandmother divided it up pretty evenly over time. I'll bet she did. I'll bet she did. I, I think Maren remembered who had it last, so yeah. I think she had a good idea of it. Yeah, she was she was apparently a very sweet lady. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're listening so. to Writers Voices with Monica and Caroline and our guest today is Linda Kephart Nash, author of When the Tempest Passes and the Wicked Is No More. Linda, how did you learn all of this story? Was it something that you just always knew growing up? Yes, I did always know it and I didn't think much about it because uh my mother didn't really converse a lot but when she did talk with me she always related all these stories and I believed for a long time that she was present at all these events and that's and I remembered everything she said and it wasn't till I finished the book that it occurred to me she couldn't have been present at any of those you know the dying <laughs> of the uh the little one and a half year old boy because he died years even before she was born and Henry at age eight had died before she was ever born and I thought these are my grandmother's words that were put into my mother and uh, and then were passed down to me and that's why I said at first I thought well my grandmother's story needs telling I think my grandmother wanted this told because of the way it came down from her to my mother to me so Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think grandma did not want the ones she lost to be forgotten. And, you know, it's uh, interesting because I think, it, particularly in that day and age, a lot of times people did not talk about their troubles and their sorrows. They yeah. just kept it kept it to themselves. Now, did you mm-hmm. share the this these stories with your children as well? Yes. <laughs> when uh not probably not all of them because I never remember <laughs> I guess I had six children and I never remembered which ones I had <laughs> told things to so they probably thought I was getting senile when they heard it more than once but anyway yeah I any any chance I had to tell anybody I did I I liked passing those down and I think my daughter Danny probably has the greatest interest and uh 
she's been into looking into the genealogy of everything, the dates and the gravestones and everything. And unfortunately, after I got into the story and she got so interested after I'd written it and it was too late to change things, she came and told me different things that uh, that made some of the things I said wrong. <laughs> thought, well, thanks a lot, Danny. <laughs> But still, it makes for a good story. It does, so yeah. But it well, was one thing that made this film. I'm sorry. One thing that made this book interesting too, uh, Linda, was the pictures, and uh, and you know that that was great. That the the pictures you had of of some of the children, and the the first picture that really caught my interest though was Tina and Cornelius's wedding picture because she did not look like a happy camper. And, no. Uh, so if you could tell, and of course we, you knew you knew from the story that she was not happy about the wedding, mm-hmm. but uh, you know that that confirmed mm-hmm. it for sure. But those yeah. those pictures were those pictures were were good. I'm glad you included those. It was very yeah. very good. Idea. Yeah, I I have a lot of a lot of photos, and I have kept up uh, my albums. I didn't stick them in a box, and so uh, I have a lot of photo albums in order. But I don't know what'll happen to them someday because. Pictures are out. <laughs> They're all out in the cloud now. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it. maybe you should have your daughter scan them. I think she did uh, a one, uh, a lot of them on my husband's side. She, I think, mm-hmm. she did. So they're in his computer, but that doesn't help me. I don't, I don't know computer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who? Which now? Which was one of your grandchildren? Was or was it your daughter that? That put your writing uh, on computer then, so that uh, that was Danny Danette Henniger, uh-huh. yeah, Dan, Danette Henniger. Yeah, yeah, she that was, was a big my, help. My, it, oh, she was a bless. She is a blessing. And uh, as I said at my signing on Saturday, if it weren't for Kurt and for my daughter Danette, uh, these scribbled pages all by hand would be in a box down in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I don't do a computer. I I hardly know how to operate my phone. So that's just me. You know, she sounds just like me, doesn't she, Monica? <laughs> well, you are of an age. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> mm-hmm. yeah. Linda, why do you think you waited so long to start writing? <laughs> I had wanted to write a long time ago, but. Uh, I think life intervened. Uh, you know, I got married because uh, I had wanted to go to college, but uh, there was no money for college. So uh, I met a really, really nice guy. And uh, so anyway, marriage did sound good. And I got married at 19, and, and uh, we had six children, and that kept me really busy. <laughs> so uh, I haven't uh, – I, I just really didn't have the time after that. I started – uh, writing uh, Christmas poems, letters, for the letter, Christmas letter. And uh, they seem to go over pretty well. And But other than that, I I didn't think about a book, but I, I did scribble off poems, and uh, I enjoyed doing that. A lot of them I threw away. <laughs> but uh, that's why it took so long. And then all this time... I felt, uh, when I look back now, it was more of a haunting of my grandmother uh, that uh, made me uh, go ahead and begin the book about her. And so I felt, I thought, well, maybe I'll quit thinking about her so much. and She'll quit waking me up at night, and I'll just get this done. <laughs> and so that was why I started in on this uh, particular uh, story, you know, her and with Ecclesiastes. Did you always have the the, the title uh, in mind before you started, or was that something that you decided as you went along, the title of the book? Uh, I thought of it, uh, it was starting to uh, formulate uh, when I had uh, written the introduction. And, uh, cause, and I thought, well, you know, a time to be born, a time to die, because I had that starting out where she was dying in uh the very first page, and I thought, that sounds like Ecclesiastes. I, said, I like but the, that. But the title of the book, When the Tempest Passes and the Wicked is No More, that was, you know, that's a, a, a intriguing title, I must say. 
Yeah, and I thought, well, it seemed like the that tempest stayed with her through her almost her whole life, but at the end, I think she was more at peace. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I she had my yeah. mother, and I think she was conv- uh, confiding a lot at that. She seemed more relaxed, and uh, well, maybe she was resigned. I don't know, but I like to think that she had found some peace in having my mother to talk to every day. You know, that last oh. few years. Sure so did. is yeah. is that title from Ecclesiastes also? Oh yes. Uh huh. Okay. So that's the that's kind of the link. Uh huh. Oh yeah. It's the um, I'm trying to think of the last verse uh, of it. You know, at the end of it, I thought so. And all of the chapter titles are also from that. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. A time to plant and a time to pluck up, a time to kill and a time to heal, mm-hmm. a time to rend and a time to sow. Yeah. yeah, and and they seem to fall into place as her life progressed. So uh, isn't yeah. that interesting? That that is very interesting. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So the last so, one, last one, a time for war and a time for peace. <laughs> mhm. <laughs> yeah, they were an armed camp. That I that I would witness. <laughs> so, yeah. So Linda, did writing this book um put your grandmother to rest in your mind? Yes, uh it did. And I thought, and if I have been too too <laughs> unfair to my grandfather, I'm sure I'm going to be faced with that someday. <laughs> but uh <laughs> And uh, I'm always ready to apologize for making mistakes, but that that was my memory of him and uh, my memory of what I was hearing uh, passed down verbally and how I put it together. So, uh, but that, you know, I could be off in some things and no doubt am, but in that case, I have a lot of apologizing to do. <laughs> so your your mother wasn't very fond of her father was she oh she adored him oh she did oh Oh. yes Uh uh-huh because she was the only one of his children he liked oh Oh, that's right he played favorites oh yes yeah that was cruel because i her sister olga uh who was younger she was six years younger than my mother uh and she was one of my favorite aunts. I had two favorite aunts, but my aunt Olga always seemed to laugh and joke and and uh, just a wild sense of humor. And she was a redhead. And uh, but I can remember one day in my mother's house, and my mother's mind was slipping at that time. And uh, Olga was there with me and my mother and. My mother made the statement because her filter wasn't working as well. And she said, I was Pa's favorite. And <laughs> I heard my aunt say under her breath, wonderful you, you know, <laughs> like oh. that. And uh, then my aunt said to me, everybody hated me. I looked just like him. And that was said like that. And... uh my cousin, her daughter, my aunt Olga's daughter, it's a, a, I have a cousin almost my age. We were very, very close. And, um, she has said this too, that, uh, that there was, uh, a lot of problems there in the family and, and, uh, Olga was very neglected, uh, by the father. And I have wondered about the boys because, uh, I, I always wondered why my mother said to me, when she, when I was about 50, she said, your dad and I had a pact when we got married, no physical violence on the children. And I got thinking, no, we never were slapped, hit, or yelled at, never. And mm. uh, didn't think much more about it until recently. And I thought, why in the world would a young couple have that on their mind? Why would they say that to each other and make that pact? And I thought, because one of them, or maybe both, had violence and uh, in the family. And uh, I did hear that, yeah, my dad got beaten with firewood at, when he was young. So, uh, yeah, I knew it was there. And 
and uh, I think my grandfather did uh, verbally abuse my two uncles. But I kind of think my grandmother would have, if she'd thought they were being physically harmed, I think she, she, she would have not tolerated that. No, I, I, from what I can glean from what you said about her, wrote about her, I, I don't think so mm-hmm. either. But mm-hmm. it was interesting though that your grandfather really, when, when it, when a child was born and there was a boy, he just rejected it. That was it. Oh, yeah, yeah, because my mother told me, uh, I didn't make those things up. She told me what he said, you know, and, mm-hmm. he, uh, you know, what he said. And my mother was born way after my Uncle Lloyd, but my mother told me that what he said when Uncle Lloyd was born, and he, Uncle Lloyd looked just like my grandmother. He, oh, he was a handsome man, and tall, and and he had curly blonde hair, and they nicknamed him Tops in school when he was there, and uh, blue eyes. And uh, when he was born, uh, Grandpa had leaned over the cradle and looked at him and then just kind of spit out, there's my girl, and stormed out of the room. And uh, that uh, that was uh, terrible, you know. Uh, so he, he didn't. He wasn't thinking. Maybe he thought boys were a nuisance or hard to discipline, and he already had one boy, and he'd lost two boys, and here was a fourth boy, and uh, he wanted a girl, and he wanted. It's one. really strange, though, because you uh-huh. think that it would be the other way around. That Hired, men... hi- oh, he made yeah, it work. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. They, had, they had to work, but they were always quiet. I never knew the my, my two uncles to talk much, but. Uh, uh, in particular, my uncle Clarence, I just adored because I lived with him off and on. They, they kind of took me in. I think I was kind of an obnoxious child. I think I got under everyone's skin, and uh, <laughs> I think I was, I think I was hyper. And it seemed like every time I walked into a room where the it was always women would be talking, and the women would talk in low voices. But when I walked in the room, I don't know who it was. It always said. There's many ears in the cornfield, and everything got quiet. And <laughs> that made me mad because that's my ears they're talking about, and I am that really irritated me. <laughs> so it sounds like your description of your mother's sister Olga as a child maybe was oh, there's a little bit of you in there. Uh, it could be. Uh, <laughs> I or had your, your gotten, grandmother's sister. Yeah, your grandmother's uh-huh, sister. Older. Yeah, that she had more energy. Yeah, yeah, could be. I got a lot of my excess energy from somebody, but uh, we. I've had a couple of grandchildren that were a little hyper, and I remember once when my kids were sitting around saying, "Well, I can't. I don't know anyone in the family that was like that," and they all turned and looked at me, and then one of them pointed a finger at me. And I thought, I'm not like that. And they all nod. And I thought, I didn't think so. <laughs> well, you needed it to have six kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chasing them around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're, they're, so, they all turned out wonderful. I think they're great. Linda, I'm proud of them. Can you read from the book for us today? Uh, yes, I I chose a little part here. And... Uh, like I mentioned before, that I had been brutally unkind to my grandfather, uh, and, uh, so I, but because I prefer not to reveal the high points of the story, I'm gonna read from A Time to Plant and A Time to Pluck Up, and that's where my grandfather appears as a normal, hardworking mm-hmm. and decent man. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but on this day, in this st- beginning of the book, uh, is where his path crosses the Hogansons' path when he knocks on their door and he's applying for a hired hand position, which he did. And this is Linda Kephart Nash reading from When the Tempest Passes and the Wicked is No More. Okay. Yeah. He kept his thoughts to himself, tamping down any frustration over circumstances he had no control over as he doggedly pursued the course he'd set for himself. He hated being poor, always working in other man's land, hated the feeling of being looked down on. Today he had time to mull over in his mind how to approach in a favorable way a Mr. Hoganson. He very much wanted the hired hand position he'd heard the farmer outside choice was looking to fill. Jolting along on the hard seat of his buggy with the steady clip-clop of the horse's hooves in his ears, 
He had plenty of time to do a lot of thinking. He had worked so hard since arriving in Winnesheek County, Iowa, when he was 16, such a long way from Norway. He'd had to learn English, struggle in school, help his father on their patch of land to grow the wheat they had all come to America to grow. He was oldest of three sons, but Eric and Herman did not want the labor-intensive life of their father and had left as soon as they could. He felt sorry for Belle, three years older than himself, Ingeborg Isabel, how she hated that name. So she was just Belle. Odd, didn't seem to fit. Any hope for marriage was left behind in Norway when she came to Iowa at the age of 19. A blessing for their mother, though, as Marin's eyesight slowly faded and she needed her daughter's help more each passing day. If Belle's lot in life distressed her, she kept that to herself, but she gave of her time and energy generously, a kind and gentle woman who left everyone who'd been in her company feeling happier and somehow better about things, Belle. She was his favorite sibling. Their mother had often related how Belle had claimed Cornelius as her own baby from the time she was three and got her first look at him, always his protector and guide as a toddler. He himself had chosen the single life, focusing on working and saving, and having his own land someday. There wasn't time or money for wife or family. When he thought of Eric, he felt the acid of jealousy. Eric, at 24, had sought his fortune in Minot, North Dakota, with some success, having no interest in the hard life of a farmer, and he very much enjoyed dressing in fine suits and stiff white collared shirts and always a really fine hat on his head. He looked quite the dandy, and showing off his success, he lured Herman into following him to Minot. Cornelius felt pride in his brother, but also recognized the envy he felt at the extreme differences in their circumstances. Recently, Emma had married and was now out of the homestead, but Carrie was still there, and as eager to get on with life as her brothers had been. He was glad Emma had married a good man, very decent. Everyone had wholeheartedly welcomed Bert into the family. Things were changing, and he too wanted change. He had been saving for 16 years and had looked at many parcels of land scattered around parts of Iowa and Minnesota. One piece looked promising on the west side of Mabel in Minnesota. Terrible access, though, almost straight up the steep hill to the large Victorian house perched like a beacon at the very top. On the east side, it could only be pasture it was so steep. Poking up from deep in the earth at the pinnacle of the hill was a gigantic pitted rock many feet high, a mystery as the land all about was not rocky. But all the acres north of the house and hill was gently rolling hills, perfect for wheat or corn. It had a good barn, hen house, corn crib, pig pen, windmill, and apple orchard. Yes, a very nice place, and the owners were an elderly couple with one son who was having health issues. He hoped the bank would look favorably on the loan he knew he would be asking for. No point dwelling further on that. He hoped Hoganson would be readily available, but he could as well be out in the field or in town. He might be uh, in for a wait to see the man. He'd dressed in his one good church suit and his only white shirt. A borrowed hat was tucked safely down by his feet. He hoped he wouldn't be covered in dust by the time he got to the Hoganson farm. And he also hoped he wouldn't have to look for nighttime lodging. He worked too hard to waste money. A jug of water and home-baked bread with cheese lay wrapped in a white cloth in a box behind his seat. When the sun was directly overhead, he'd guided the horse into a farmyard to a horse tank and called to a woman busy at her clothesline if his horse could have water and a short rest in the shade. She nodded and continued with her work while he sat in the buggy eating his lunch, tipping the quart jar of water to his mouth periodically, pausing to wipe the crumbs and moisture away with a clean white handkerchief from a large mustache covering his entire upper lip. The trip was nearing its end, finally. He'd seen a sign bearing the name Choice and knew he was nearing the town as more homes and gardens came into sight. 
he hoped to see someone who could point him in the right direction to the Hovinson farmstead, but was beginning to think he'd be in town limits before anyone would appear. However, when cresting a low hill, he spotted someone working in a garden next to a small, run-down house. He'd passed a few like it, mixed with others, kept neat and painted. Now he turned the horse's head towards the dirt track leading to the house and to a worn-looking woman in a weedy garden. A ragamuffin girl with a matted hair stood silently as her mother straightened and turned hard eyes on the stranger in her yard. He was polite in asking for the information he needed, and the woman did indeed know the farm and gave him the needed directions, carefully backing and turning the buggy, with the young girl following and staring, Cornelius became aware of an urchin of a boy sitting on the low roof of the house, watching everything. The absurdity of it stopped him, and puzzled, he asked the girl why the boy, no doubt her brother, was on the roof, and taking much time to answer, he was about to continue out the dirt road with no explanation when she said, "'Cause he gets a beaten when he gets down. To which Cornelius had to ask, and what did he do to deserve the beating? But apparently she was through talking, as she shrugged her thin shoulders indifferently, and with no expression on her face, returned to her mother. He looked again at the silent lump sitting on the roof, glanced at the careworn figure who had returned to her battle with nature in the garden, then clicked at the horse, gave a flick of the rein, and left the dreary scene behind. Spare the rod and spoil the child was an echo in his head. He'd taken a few beatings of his own and survived, plus a couple not his own. <laughs> He'd been raised in the Lutheran church, was a faithful attender, and in his third year as trustee. He, it had been fairly recent that he'd heard a sermon on the spare the rod theme, and the thought came that maybe he'd been spared a lot by not marrying and having to civilize a brood of children, boys in particular. They seemed to be the most troublesome. Following the woman's directions, he turned back the direction he'd come. So I'd like to know how, how you came uh, to get this book published. I see it's Outskirts Press is the publisher. Yes, and again, I was relying on my my bright daughter to uh she researched she came up with two or three suggestions, and uh one one of them uh had said that they they had their quota they couldn't take any more, so we went on to uh this one and uh have been very, very happy with it because uh, uh they have arranged it in such a way that I don't have to go out i I'm going to be eighty four four pretty soon, and I am not about to go around selling books, but uh, they handle it over Amazon, and uh, I think I think 30 or 40 different outlets, because I've heard that it's in Argentina or Brazil, I can't remember now, and in England, so uh, they take care of the advertising, and uh, uh, it's, it's working really well this oh, way. Oh, wonderful. But my daughter did all the research, and she takes care of all that. So I appreciate that. I can't do it. Well, it's pretty unusual to have, like, even the second publisher you go to accept your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they looked it over, and uh, and because uh, uh, Danny had edited it, I'd gone over it, and Kurt Swarm had edited it, it so uh, they they accepted it and and said that the characters were very uh you know you had you could have uh feelings for them they were uh, mm -hmm. very right. real you know right. so they they liked that so anyway well you know this is a, this is a piece of american history and uh that's that's important in today's world uh, i think yes uh <laughs> yes when i have heard that a lot of ch children don't know uh anything about clocks even you know can you imagine that uh, uh, yeah, I can only imagine that. <laughs> yeah, think of all the things we don't have to learn anymore. You don't yeah. have to learn how to tell time. You don't have to learn how to um, how to read cursive. You don't have to, you know, you barely have to learn how to add and subtract because of calculators. <laughs> right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, because uh, oh. things have changed drastically and... Uh, 
It's a new world. On the other hand, you have to learn how to use computers and how to <laughs> use, you know, my, my granddaughter, by the time she was three, knew how to use an iPhone, an Android, a Kindle, a PC, and a, and a Mac. I can or an iP- it. iPad. She could, uh, she could do it all. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, they, I, I, I made jokes saying that, uh, I think that, uh, my great grandkids could probably operate my computer for me and help me if Danny didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. She, she's eight now and is trying to teach me to play video games. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. She says I'm getting better. So. <laughs> Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> oh, cute. But but every now and then I just have to hand the controller to her to get me out of the situation I'm in. <laughs> oh. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, it's they good they they like it because, like yeah. you say, they they learn it just so naturally. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, Linda, you wrote, you mentioned you write by hand, that you don't write on the computer. No. And how long did it, did you take and and is your writing process do you like write an entire first draft and then go back or do you like rework things as you go a little bit of both you know because i just start writing and uh and then sometimes when sometimes when i read i read back over and i think well i don't like that and i'll alter it right there and scribble it in the edges you know it's a mess and uh, so the first draft is really a mess but uh, then I, I read it again, and uh, sometimes I have to uh, add it. Well, Kurt would tell me I have not explained. You did not. You mentioned that. It's interesting, and you didn't tell anything about it. Now you got to go back and fill it in. <laughs> so oh, I would okay. I'd write another whole page that had to fit in. I did not want to do that, you know, but I because I thought by then I thought, oh, I'm done. I'm about done, and I'm tired of this now. And so, <laughs> anyway, I did. I did what he said, and I would. Then I'd have another whole page, and so then I would recopy it all, and read it over again. And then I'd say, I forgot a, 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 the word the. I forgot the word this. You know, I. So then I copied it a third time, and then I would hand it to my daughter, and uh, she would edit it, and put all the uh, those sticky things on them for me to correct. <laughs> So I think altogether, I probably wrote it four times, and uh, and, uh, and then she and put then it. she typed it in. Okay. Yeah. And then was there another editing process after that? Uh, well, we sent then a PDF to uh, Kurt, and uh, he uh, he made a copy of everything and put all of the sticky uh, sticky corrections. <laughs> My punctuation was always so terrible. And, uh, or if he thought something needed more explanation, uh, then it would come back to me. And see that, and Danny would have it all in the computer, but then she would go and I, I would show her what Kurt gave me and I would have the corrections on it and with all the sticky marks and she would go back to the computer and make the corrections in the computer for me. So, uh, that, that's where we're at right now. And, we're very so, fortunate to have that help. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the end, there were probably five or six drafts. Oh yeah, am I four and Kurt's one, and then yeah, and then Danny did one, and then one, then we both just finished up uh, reading the last one, and so anyway, yeah, a good six anyway. So yeah. and then did your publisher do any editing? Oh, they they do one too to make sure you know we don't write something <laughs> oh too that's really real offensive because <clears throat> they have standards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you have another you have another book too. This, this this is not your only one. You work on another one, right? Yes, and it's ready to go to uh <clears throat> print too now. Uh, oh my the gosh. only thing left to do to send it to uh to uh outskirts is uh, the artwork was done by one of our local artists, uh, Daniel uh Hadala. And uh, so his artwork is the decoration at the top of each uh chapter and uh, there are several uh, uh illustrations that he did and he designed the cover <clears throat> Excuse and, me. and what is this book about and uh, it's uh on the scripture of uh a uh let's see i've stopped to even think 
if I can get all my books confused, uh, A Spacious Place, and that is in Scripture, too. Uh, I've got to see. Where did I? Okay. Is it also historical fiction? Is it based on family story? or? No, it's all fiction, but it's based on something that is factual. It's uh, on uh, what on abuse, you know, the abuse of women. Because uh, I... I get so angry over when I hear the things that happen, what women have to put up with, and mm-hmm. uh, I get I get really angry, and I don't know why because I have never been abused, and I thought I don't I haven't walked in their shoes, and yet uh, I'm angry for them. So uh, my uh, this uh, second book, a daughter had sent me a mug called please do it was written on it please do not annoy the writer she may put you in a book and kill you and (laughs) and i was sitting at my window looking at my you know my delicious coffee and drinking out of that wonderful cup and looking out the window and listening to the birds and but the more i looked at it the more i thought yeah i know a couple people i could put in a book and kill and they were they were abusive. They were abusive, you know. And so I went right downstairs and drew up, uh, you know, scribbled out uh, an idea. And uh, so it's that's the one that's done now. It's a spacious place, uh-huh. and the scripture has to do with uh, uh, God, you know, reaching down, and it had to do with lifting uh, David out of a you know, out of a bad place and setting his feet in a spacious place. Um, mm. his, uh, his life was in danger. And uh, so this is why I chose uh, a spacious place. Because, uh, again, it's, uh, it has my scripture in it. And I, I, uh, I, I am a Christian, and I, I love my Bible, and I love the things that are written in it. And some of them are written so beautifully, and they, all, they still apply to everything today. So, oh, yeah. So anyway, that's the next one. But well, Linda, we're out of time, so we're uh, going to have to wrap up. I unfortunately, want to thank you so much. <laughs> I want to uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and uh, Caroline, do you have a closing quote? Yes, I do. This actually is is from the book, and uh, Linda says, "My uncle Clarence sang and talked to me, and something he said keeps coming back. There's a little bit of bad in the best of us, and a little bit of good in the worst of us." So it does not behove the best of us to point the finger at the rest of us. How true. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Never forgot it. <laughs> yeah. Aww. Right. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, thank you. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. <laughs>